Hey future respiratory therapists, today we've got part two of our PFT series and we're talking all about lung volumes. Let's dive in. Okay, so here we go. We're talking about lung volumes in relations to pulmonary function testing, okay? And so what I already have here on the board for you is something that to understand how to interpret lung volumes on um, your pulmonary function testing results that you're going to get either on your MBRC exam or if you're learning it in class or if you go out and practice uh, pulmonary function testing, you're going you're gonna to have to understand these concepts. Now this is going to go way back to probably the very first semester of school and this is something that somebody told you to memorize, okay? And now I'm telling you to apply it, okay? Now what we're talking about here are lung volumes. Every individual has four lung volumes. Here they are right here. This is going to be our normal column. Okay, lung volumes start with tidal volume. To me, that's the easiest one to remember. Everybody knows that everybody is taking in breaths, certain amount of breaths each minute, right? So those are tidal volumes. Now, if you ask me to, I can take in a deeper volume on top of a normal volume, and that would be my inspiratory reserve volume. Now, just like I can take in more then my inspiratory, my inspired tidal volume, I can also blow out more than a normal tidal volume. And that is my expiratory reserve volume. And then there's always a little bit of gas trapped in everybody's lung that we cannot exhale ever. That's called residual volume. Okay, those are the four lung volumes. Now, those same four lung volumes come into play when we're talking about lung volumes related to obstructive lung diseases and restrictive lung diseases, okay? So, we know that obstructive lung diseases have difficulties due to the increase in airway resistance and getting all the gas out of their lungs. This leads to chronic hyperinflation or chronic air trapping, and chronic air trapping leads to hyperinflation. These patients have enlarged lung volumes, okay? So that's the first thing you want to see and note here right off the bat is when we talk about a normal lung volume, 80 to 120% is considered normal. Now, this person over here is up here at 120%, okay? I mean, 125%. This is an obstructive lung disease patient. Their TLC is greater than 120% of their predicted, okay? So you want to point that out. So chronic air trapping leads to chronic hyperinflation, leads to an enlarged total lung capacity. Now remember, capacity is all four volumes put together. So residual volume, expert reserve volume, tidal volume, and IRV all together make up total lung capacity. Okay, so if you can remember these volumes and capacities, you have four volumes and you have four capacities. A capacity is made up of two or more volumes. Okay, we're going to talk about this more here in just a second. So let me show you with our, with our obstructive lung disease here. Let's just say this is an emphysematic, okay? Uh, you can see their, their RV has increased. Why? Chronic air trapping leads to an increase in your residual volume. Their ERV is still here, their tidal volume, and then their IRV. Now, you know, this isn't drawn to perfect scale. So what you actually see is where your RV and your ERV um, actually make up a, a, an enlarged amount of this volume. And then your IRV is very, very, very small because of the hyperinflation, their, their, their lungs are already hyperinflated, so they don't have a lot of inspiratory reserve volume, okay? Uh, when you look at this box I have here, this is obviously our restrictive lung disease, and it's restrictive because the TLC is less than 80%. You can see they're coming in here at about 75%. Now, the, the restrictive lung disease patient looks just like the normal except everything is decreased. So you have your RV, you have your ERV, you have your tidal volume and your IRV 
and they're all proportionally decreased to what it was when it was normal. Okay, remember restrictive lung disease, such as like things like pulmonary fibrosis, okay, um, is, is a lung disease where these patients have a hard time getting volume in. Go back to part one. Remember, they only get a little bit of volume in, but all that volume comes out when you do spirometry at a normal rate because there is no airway resistance problem. This is a parenchymal problem to where they don't receive the gas. They can't get the gas in. They lose residual volume. They lose expiratory reserve volume. They lose the ability to take in normal tidal volumes and they lose the ability to take in a normal inspiratory reserve volume. So that's the basis for how you have to think about the lung volumes in regards to does my patient have an obstructive lung disease or a restrictive lung disease when I'm looking at a pulmonary function test and specifically lung volumes, okay? Now, before we get off of this and talk about something else, let me just, let's just talk uh, real quick just as a reminder. Remember, ERV and RV make up FRC, okay? IRV and tidal volume make up IC. This is your inspiratory capacity and your expiratory and your residual volumes make up your functional residual capacity, okay? IRV all the way down to ERV makes up vital capacity. So, so have a person take in a deep breath all the way in and then blow it all the way out so they can't blow it anymore and they just performed a vital capacity. Now that should help you make sense and just a refresher on all of the volumes and the capacities. We already said TLC is all four of them. Okay, so you're gonna have to, like I said, you have to know those volumes and capacities to really make this make sense. Now, if this makes sense right here, then I'm gonna shift gears and we're gonna go and then we're gonna talk about some numbers, okay? So uh, let's do this real quick, okay? So I'm gonna erase this. Okay, and let's just say that we have TLC here and RV here, and we're going to have three patients. One, two, and three. Okay, and just like we did with the, F, the, with the um, spirometry, then we can make a little chart here. Okay, so let's say that um, we have... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scoot this over one more spot here. These are predicted. There we go. Now we're ready. So this is TLC. This is RV. And then we're going to fill in a blank here to make the difference up. Okay. So here we go. So let's say I predicted TLC is 6. Okay. Um, so we'll do that. And then let's say I predicted R six, point liter, 6 liters and then I predicted RV is 1.2 liters. Now these, just like I told you about spirometry, the FVC and the FEV1 are the two primary components that are going to help you. If you're not, if you're a specialist in pulmonary function testing, then you're going to know everything about all the different studies, okay? But if you are uh, looking for ways to easily break this down and remember it for your board exams or for your upcoming finals, this is what you got to look at. Look at your TLC and look at your RV. Now patient number one, has a TLC of, let's go 9.2 liters, okay? Um, and, a, and an RV of, I don't know, let's just go 3.4 liters. Now patient number two has a total lung capacity of 5.9 liters and a residual volume of 1.1 liters. And then patient number three has a uh, total lung capacity of four liters and a residual volume of, let's say, one liter, okay? So, let's break this down and show you how you look at it. Now, you need a calculator for this, okay? Because we've already given you the, num the number, uh, the normal values for this, right? So, remember, if predicted is six, and patient one has a 9.2 liters divided by six, 
that gives them their their total lung capacity is 153%. Now obviously this is an extreme example, but also not completely impossible. Remember 80 to 120 percent was normal. So this person has an increased total lung capacity. Now we know right now that this person has an obstructive lung disease. 100%. Because remember a restrictive lung disease would not lead to an increase in your total lung capacity. Okay? A, um, a normal patient wouldn't have 153% predicted total lung capacity. It would be 80 to 120%. So let's look at patient two and see what their total lung capacity is. 5.9 divided by 6. Divided by 6 is... This person is 98%. So obviously they're in a normal range, right? And then we have 4 divided by 6 is 67%. So this is 67% of their predicted. So they obviously have a decreased total lung capacity. So we could go ahead and label this. Now we know this patient number one is our obstructive lung disease. Patient number three is our restrictive lung disease. And patient number two has our, is our normal patient from what we know right now. Okay. Now when we look at residual volume, you're going to see here that um, we do 3.4 divided by 1.2. You can see that this person's residual volume is up 283%. Okay, the 1.1 divided by 1.2, 92%. That's in a normal range. And then we've got 1 divided by 1.2 is 83%. Okay, now here's what I want to show you. Okay, obviously increased residual volume. Why? Chronic air trapping leads to chronic hyperinflation. Okay, um, normal residual volume. This one shows to have a normal residual volume. I probably messed the numbers up there just a little bit, but just, just go with it for now. Okay, now watch. What I'm going to do here is break down the RV to TLC. Okay, now when we do that, we know that RV should make up roughly around 20% of our TLC. So when you look at residual volume, normal should be about 20%. So if we do uh, five, if we do, let's start with the normal one right here. 1.1 divided by 5.9 and we get about 19% and that's correct. Now when we do the restrictive lung disease and do one divided by four, we get 25%. When we do the obstructive lung disease, we get 3.4 divided by 9.2 and we get 37%. Now predicted here, if you do um, 1.2 divided by six, like I told you, you're gonna get about 20%, okay? So about 20%. Now watch, these two patients, okay? Their residual volume to their total lung capacity is within a normal range. Okay, I know I said it was in 20%, but what we're looking for here is less than 35%. Some texts say 30%, some say 35% if you get into the, no, I can't remember the textbook right now, but the, uh, the specific pulmonary function test books, they have a little bit different ranges from what Egan states, okay? Um, but typically, the RV to TLC will tell you if your residual volume is increased excessively in regards or in relationship to your total lung capacity. Now, if you remember where we went to before we came to this chart, remember that the residual volume on the obstructive lung disease had increased as well as the total lung capacity, okay? So I'm gonna give you one more example here of what you might see, okay? So this should make sense, right? This, how do we know which is which? Increased lung volumes, Increase RV to TLC is going to, to point you to an obstructive lung disease. Decrease lung volumes with a normal RV to TLC tells you you're dealing with restrictive lung disease. Okay, And then normal lung volumes with a normal RV to TLC just supports normal values. Okay, so that's kind of how you break that down. What I want to do is differentiate between two obstructive lung disease patients real quick. Okay, and what I'm going to, what we're going to do is throw some numbers up here.
So we're talking about right now, we're talking about emphysema. So let's just go COPD versus acute asthma. Okay. Now with COPD, you will see an increase in your TLC 100%. With acute asthma, you will have normal total lung capacity. Now what's weird about this is, is that your total lung capacity with acute asthma, you would think, well, wait a second, why is my total lung capacity not increased? Well, remember, what leads to increased total lung capacity? And the answer is chronic air trapping, which leads to chronic hyperinflation. Okay, so if this is normal here, this is our box here, okay? And we're just gonna go TLC, and then we're gonna go RV. Looks like this, okay? If this is our COPD patient over here, then you're going to see they have an increase in their total lung capacity. And their RV will be proportionally increased as well. So increased RV, increased TLC. But they increase proportionally. So this person's RV to TLC would be approximately 30%, okay? The asthmatic over here is going to have the same TLC. The acute lung disease does not change when we're talking about TLC, so their TLC will be normal, but their RV will be way up here because they now have trapped gas that they cannot get out. And so for this acute asthma, you would have an RV, I'm going to put it up here, RV to TLC of, let's say, let's say here we have approximately 45%, okay? My point is, is greater than 35% is an indication for you the difference between chronic air trapping and chronic hyperinflation versus acute severe air trapping if it's greater than 35 percent let me write it here i was going to change this okay so rv to tlc greater than 35 percent equals acute air trapping and you're going to be thinking acute asthma i know you can't read that but you know what i'm saying if you have an rv to TLC that's less than 35%, but an increased TLC, then you're looking at chronic hyperinflation. And that's what it comes down to. That's what it all comes down to, guys. If your volumes are increased, you've got an obstructive lung disease. If your volumes are decreased, you have a restrictive lung disease. If you have an increased RV to TLC greater than 35%, you're looking, going to be thinking and considering acute air trapping, such as status asthmaticus. If all your volumes are up, but your RV to TLC is, say, 30% or 29%, those volumes are still increased. And that's the result of chronic hyperinflation due to chronic air trapping because everything over the years, the volumes have slowly increased, slowly increased, slowly increased, but they've kind of increased together. And yes, their RV goes up, okay, but not significantly, okay? So that's how you um, interpret lung volumes. Now, the last thing I need to tell you about, especially for your board exams, because if I don't throw this in here, it'll be a huge disservice to you, okay? And here we go. You ready? So this is what it looks like. This is how we get. So the testing for lung volumes, there's three different ways. You have the nitrogen washout. You have two, the helium dilution. And three, you have, I'm just going to put the body box. The real word is body plethysmography, okay? Now what you need to know about these 
is that the nitrogen washout is AKA the open circuit test. The helium dilution is AKA closed circuit test. This is just how they do the test, okay? And if your board exams ask you, you have lung volumes performed via an open circuit test, then you know, oh, we're talking nitrogen washout. If they say via closed circuit test, then you know we're talking helium dilution. Now what you need to remember about the body plethysmography is that it measures thoracic gas volume. That's different than these two, which measure alveolar volume. So if you have free thoracic gas, you may get a skewed number through the body plethysmography than you will with these two because these are actually measuring gas moving in and out of alveolar units until a state of equilibrium, equilibrium is reached, right? Now, the last thing you need to do is put a star by this one and understand that this test gives 100% oxygen to wash out the nitrogen. Now, in regards to the NBRC, I have seen this question asked before, and they like to ask you if you have a patient with a chronic hypercapnia or a COPD patient, they like to ask you if you're going to use and you're going to perform lung volumes, which test would you choose? And they would give you A, nitrogen washout, B, helium dilution, C would be spirometry, which is wrong because it doesn't tell you lung volumes, and D, um, single breath DLCO, which doesn't tell you lung volumes, okay? So you have to choose now between A and B. Both of them are, will give you lung volumes. So what's the right answer? Well, remember, they told you chronic hypercapnia, COPD, and what they want you to realize is you do not want to give that person an excessive amount of oxygen. So this would not be the test for your COPD population with documented chronic hypercapnia. Okay, you would want to go with the helium dilution here. And that's a question I'd like to get you with because this is going to be something that you're going to quickly forget once you get done with school or once you probably even take the test. Open circuit, closed circuit, 100% oxygen helium, eh, it all starts running together, right? So write these notes down, keep them somewhere, right before you go take your test, refresh on it, and know these pulmonary function lung volume tests before you get in, okay? So, hey guys, I hope this makes sense. If you, if, if you will, give me a comment down below. Let me know if it makes sense, if you like it, if it doesn't make sense, if I just did more damage by confusing you. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. Give me a thumbs up, turn on all bell notifications, and we will see you soon. Best wishes.